Good morning, everybody. My name is Chip Edens, and I'm the rector of Christ Church, and I'm joined by Joan Killian, my an associate here. Joan, good morning. Good morning. How are and you? we are doing great. We're so happy to have uh, today with us our very special guest, Catherine Hayhoe. She's an atmospheric scientist and a professor of political science at Texas Tech, where she's also the director of the Climate Science Center. She has co-authored a number of reports for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, as well as for the National Academy of Sciences. And she, in 19, excuse, in, excuse me, 19, what? 2019, how about that? Uh, Catherine Hayo was named one of the United Nations Champions of the Earth, which is incredible. So it's an honor today, Catherine, to have you with us. Uh, without a doubt, you are uh, one of the leading experts in the world on this topic and, the, and how it converges with theology. She is an evangelical Christian, the daughter of missionaries, and uh, with, together with her husband, uh, they have written a book called A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions. And her husband is a pastor in a church in Lubbock. Catherine, welcome. Welcome to the Faith Forum. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, in giving us dominion over things on the earth, you made us fellow workers in your creation. Give us wisdom and reverence to see the resources of nature that no one may suffer from our abuse of them and that generations to come may continue to praise you for your bounty through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, Catherine, I'd love just to start with a little bit of background, uh, and you have an amazing, interesting background, the daughter of missionaries. Tell us about that. What was that like? Well, I'm Canadian, first of all, born in Toronto, and when I was nine years old, our family moved down to Columbia, South America, um, in the middle of um, all the events that are happening in that Netflix series, Narcos, if anybody watches that, <laughs> that's when we were there. Mm -hmm. um, and my parents were working at a local school and working with the local church, and we lived there for a number of years off and on until I came back to go to university. Um, so growing up as a child in that situation, it really opens your eyes to a different way that the world can be. Mm -hmm. and, and say something about when I guess you became sort of conscious of environmental issues uh, and and just sort of about that that movement toward exploring the issues of, of climate and our environment. Mm -hmm. Well, I had always been interested in science from an early age because my dad was actually a science teacher. So I grew up with the idea that science was the most interesting thing that anybody could possibly study and who would want to ever study anything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when I came back to go to university, I was originally studying astrophysics. Um, and the idea that using nothing more than our human brain and, and the instruments and telescopes we can build on this relatively insignificant planet, and using that we can explore the furthest reaches of the universe, that is absolutely amazing. Mm. So I was planning on continuing that, but um, as I got towards the end of my undergraduate degree, I still needed an extra class. So I looked around and there was this brand new class on climate change over in the geography department. And I thought to myself, well, that looks interesting. I mean, I had grown up with the idea that, you know, biodiversity loss and deforestation and air pollution and climate change, they're these environmental issues that environmentalists care about and they are working on fixing them and the rest of us wish them well. But then I took this class and I was completely shocked to find out that, first of all, that climate science was the exact same science I've been learning in my physics classes. I'm not sure what I thought it was, but I didn't think it was that. But what really changed my life is finding out that climate change is, as the U.S. military now calls it, a threat multiplier. Mm. In other words, it takes all of the issues that we already care about today, not only what we might consider environmental issues, but issues like poverty and hunger, disease, lack of access to clean water, equality. It takes these issues and it makes them worse. And in fact, we can't fix any of these issues if we leave climate change out of the picture. So recognizing that it's the poor and the vulnerable who are disproportionately affected by the impacts of a changing climate. And those, those people are not faceless people to me. They have faces and names and I know what their homes look like and I've been there and I've lived there. 
recognizing that made me feel like, how can I not do everything I can to help with this urgent global problem? Because it's so urgent that surely everyone recognizes that and will fix it soon. And then I can go back to studying galaxies. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Well, uh, talk to me a little bit about, I mean, so much of the journey of faith is uh, becoming conscious of, of something and then trying to figure out what it means, how we sort of integrate it into our lives which obviously involves life change and uh, life change can be really, really difficult. I'm sort of curious about, you know, I guess your own, the own evolution in your own thinking. And mm -hmm. maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, sort of what you had to kind of come to terms with in your own life and maybe some practices that you engage in now uh, mm -hmm. to, be a, to be a steward. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you speak to that? Absolutely. So growing up as a missionary kid and my husband, as you mentioned, as a pastor, it took me a long time, quite a while to see what I was doing as a mission too. Hmm. For some reason, I thought, you know, there's God's first tier um, that you do if you feel called to ministry. And then there's, you know, the second tier where we use the skills and the abilities God gave us, but it's sort of, you know, second tier. I somehow, I, I never really heard that explicitly, but somehow I sort of absorbed that. And so for, it took me a very surprisingly long time until I realized that I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. And when we're doing what God wants us to do, whether it is being a stay-at-home parent, being a teacher, working in the medical field, working in business or accounting, whatever we're doing, if we're using the abilities God gave us, we're doing what he wants us to do. And there is no second tier. There's just the first tier of being who God made us to be. So, so realizing that has probably been my most important spiritual journey, I think. Mm -hmm. And I very much feel today as if I'm just walking in the good works that he's prepared for me in advance. Mm -hmm. I frequently think to myself, I can't see two steps ahead. Sometimes I can see one step ahead where I'm supposed to step next, but I can never see two steps ahead. But I think that's okay, because if we really feel like we're doing what God wants us to do, then, you know, when we need to know, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what that next step is. And of course, as we humans, we would like to see everything mapped out. We would like a map handed to right. us at the beginning of our lives. And people actually used to do that, you know, with their horoscopes. We would like a map that tells us exactly where we're going to be going through our whole life. But that's not the way God works. He just says, trust me. So in trusting him, it's led me down some very interesting paths. Um, related to looking at how we care for each other and how we care for this world that we live in. I very much base what I do and what I believe on the Bible. Um, beginning in Genesis 1, it talks about how humans have responsibility over every living thing on this planet, which includes plants and animals, but it also includes our sisters and brothers, fellow humans. And then all the way through the Bible, it talks about God's love and care for this planet, for creation, for the smallest aspects of it. Throughout the New Testament, there's so much about loving and caring for others who are less fortunate than us, the poor and the orphans and the widows. And then at the very end of the Bible in Revelation, we've got God will destroy those who destroy the earth <laughs> right at the end. Yeah. So based on that, how do we then live, so to speak? What do we do with that information? I believe that for everyone, it looks different. Mm. Too often, people try to create a new set of green 10 commandments mm -hmm. thou shalt mm -hmm. and there's certainly you know there's certainly some things that make sense for us to do so for example as a church body it makes sense to do an energy audit so that we're not wasting our energy and our money that we can be good stewards of our resources mm -hmm. it makes sense to support organizations that are caring for people and for living things on this planet and there's all kinds of amazing christian organizations that are doing that it makes sense to uh, learn and to talk about what the Bible says. It makes sense to not be wasteful with our resources. Um, here in North America, we throw out about 40% of the food that we produce, 40%. And if food waste were its own country, because when, it, when food waste decays, it produces heat trapping gases. If food waste were its own country, it would be the fourth biggest producer of heat trapping gases in the world. Wow. So there's lots of things that we can do, but I really feel like it comes down to what's in our hearts. And in our hearts is really, as, as the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, it's not fear. What God has given us is power, the ability to act, love, to think of others before ourselves. And as a scientist, my favorite part, a sound mind to make good decisions based on the information that God gives us.
<laughs> Say something about the work you've done with the church. We're going to pivot in just a little bit and talk a little bit about some, some of the more details, some of the practices. Uh, but I want to just uh, think with you about uh, the conversations you've had with the church. And surprisingly, they, they haven't always been easy. And I, I'm just sort of, in light of what you just said about the Bible and about, and about creation and, and then the book of Revelation, uh, hello there. Uh, why uh, do you think it's been difficult to have a conversation with the church about the environment? Well, the conversations with the church are primarily difficult in the United States. Huh. Conversations outside the United States in Canada, where I'm from, the reaction is generally, oh, I haven't thought about that. In the UK, many churches are already very concerned about it. In Europe, creation care is part of many churches' ethics. Um, I just recently did events with um, the Orthodox Church. I've done events with the Catholic Church. Um, the Anglican Church is well known. The Episcopal Church is well known for speaking out about issues of climate change, creation care, and caring for every living thing on this planet. So what's going on in the United States? What's different? It's not a different Bible, same Bible. Um, it's not different leaders, you know, with Catholics, for example, same Pope, everywhere. So what makes the U.S. different than any other country? And unfortunately, there's one word. And it's one of those words that's on the tip of everybody's tongue these days. The word is politics. Mm. In the United States, and this is not something that's happened quickly, it's happened very gradually over decades, increasingly what we believe has become linked with our political identity to the point where today many people in the United States who identify as Christian, their statement of faith is written first by their political identity and only a very distant second by the Bible. And if the two come into conflict, they will go with politics over the Bible. Hmm. So how does that relate to climate change? Well, a thermometer isn't Democrat or Republican. It doesn't give you a different answer depending on how you vote. We've known that the planet is warming because humans are digging up and burning coal and gas and oil since the 1800s. That's how long we've known it. And we've known that in the UK, we've known that in Europe, we've known that in North America. So how did it get so politicized? It's because that information has an implication. And the implication is we need to do something about this. It's been 55 years since scientists formally warned a US president about the dangers of a warming planet. And that president was Lyndon B. Johnson. Mm. And so scientists can say, climate is changing, humans are responsible, we've really checked, it's not a natural cycle, and the impacts are serious. And then that's right at the boundary between um, what philosopher David Hume back in the 1700s would call the is versus the ought boundary. Scientists mm. explain what is, but then we've got the ought, what should we do about it? And that's where it gets political because unfortunately many of the richest corporations in the world are the ones that are producing all this carbon pollution and they don't wanna stop. So they decide it's a lot easier to just get a bunch of politicians to agree with us and to say, oh, those scientists have no idea what they're talking about. So it's gotten to the point now where climate change is the number one most politicized issue in the entire United States. And it's been that way for over 10 years. Mm. Even with COVID, COVID is number three now, most politically polarized. Number two is racial justice. And number one is still climate change. The number one predictor of whether we agree with the science is just where we fall in the political spectrum. And unfortunately, it breaks my heart to say we have let our faith get wrapped up in that. Hmm. Well, uh, so I want to just ask you, um, before I turn things over, Joan, there's so many things that you're, you're bringing up. I feel like we could talk forever. Um, but you, you live in Texas. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering um, how you think about, uh, you know, a lot of wonderful people who live in Texas that are in the oil and gas business. And how do you think about, uh, you know, conversations, uh, the, uh, you know, obviously change could interrupt and, and just disrupt a lot of lives, a, a way of life for a very, very long time. So how do you think about that, um, uh, you know, versus say, you could say, well, we're just going to shut everything down and mm -hmm. let chips fall as they may, uh, or there's perhaps a, a, a different horizon of change. Uh, you know, that seems to be 
one of the places where we, we get into a, 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 have a real challenge conversation. So um, say something about being in Texas and, and what change looks like there in a way that you know, takes into serious consideration the earth as well as traditions and lives and livelihoods for generations. Well, I had to confront that question head on when I was invited a number of years ago to speak to the board of a large oil and gas company. I have a policy that I won't accept an invitation unless I can figure out how to start the conversation with something that we both agree on, a value that we share, a perspective that we have. So when I was invited to come speak to this board, I thought to myself, well, I can't go unless I can figure out how to start the conversation on something that we both agree on. So I sat down and I thought about it and I realized that I am profoundly grateful for fossil fuels. Mm. I looked back in history and I thought about what my life would have been like 200, 300 years ago. It would have been short. It would have been much more difficult. And I am profoundly grateful for all the advances that fossil fuels have brought. Thanks to the industrial revolution, we saw incredible advances in our medical capacity. We saw advances like everybody, you know, having electricity here in rich countries. We just take it for granted that you can flip a switch on the wall and things go on. Back in the day, a hundred years ago, um, appliances were just coming in and they were specifically advertised as freeing up women because women's labor was just washing clothes, getting food, cooking food, cleaning up food, washing clothes, washing the house. And women were able finally to move into a sphere where they could get education. They could look at more just beyond the home. And then thinking of the history of the United States, one of the biggest contributors to the North being able to win out over the South in the war against slavery was industrialization too, which was powered by fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I'm genuinely grateful for fossil fuels and I'm grateful for them right here today because we have solar panels, I have a plug-in car, but that's not enough. I use more energy. I live in Texas, my family lives in Canada. I like to go visit them. I use fossil fuels and I'm grateful for what they provide. So when I went in to speak to that board, I still remember walking into that conference room. There was one person who invited me was smiling. A couple of other people were getting coffee. Most other people were sort of sitting here like this. <laughs> <laughs> like, who did you invite to come talk to us? <laughs> but when I started by saying how grateful I was for the coal and oil and gas that we've been using the last 300 years, you could just see the change in people's faces. And I still remember one man said, he, almost disbelieving, and he said, you get it. We're not the bad guys. People need energy today. If we just pulled the plug on everything today, there'd be a lot of suffering. And I said, you're right there. It would be. <laughs> So from that point, we were able to have an incredible conversation that not only covered where we've been, but where we're going. Because here's the reality. The reality is we don't use horses and buggies anymore. Why? We have something better and different. We don't use party line telephones anymore. We have something in our hand that is as powerful as a supercomputer that filled an entire room back in the 1950s. We know that technology moves along. And here's the interesting thing here in Texas, we are already getting 20% of our electricity from wind and sun. Mm. So things are changing. And when I started to mention that, somebody perked up and they said, oh yes, they said, we're actually putting in a wind energy installation to power our, our, our um, operations out in West Texas. <laughs> and I said, well, there you go. The world is changing. So I said, how could you get out ahead of the curve? Because I said, make no mistake, if you, if, you, you know, if you pin all your hopes on the horses and buggies, so to speak, you will be out of business eventually. So how could you get ahead of the curve? Because you know energy, number one. You understand uh, the landscape. You have many people who need jobs. So how could we think together proactively about this? And that's a conversation about something that's called just transition. The idea that there's many communities, especially, for example, in West Virginia or Kentucky and here in West Texas, that are built around the fossil fuel economy. And you can't just say, no, you can't do this anymore. And unfortunately, a lot of coal mines are doing that because they're just shutting it down because they go bankrupt. 
when they do that, they don't take care of all the people they've left behind. So that's why we need that society-wide conversation about what we can do to help people. So for example, I was in Utah a number of years ago and they were talking about shutting down one of their coal mines because um, coal mining is not only responsible for heat trapping gases, it's also responsible for terrible air pollution. And Salt Lake City has horrible air pollution. Mm. So they were saying, well, in this town, that's the main industry. So we don't wanna shut down the coal mine until we can get another business or industry to move there for manufacturing purposes. And then we, as the state government, we can work with them to provide free training for people so that people will not lose their job if they don't want to, they can move to this other facility. And so these are the types of things that are already happening. And in fact, our solar panels come from an organization called Mission Solar in San Antonio, where the last time that oil prices fell pre-pandemic, they took in a bunch of people who lost their jobs in the oil field because when prices fall, they just let everybody go and they retrain them to do solar panel manufacturing. So I love that we actually got to be a little tiny part of that just transition. Thank you so much. Uh, amazing. We're going to re reflect more on j just transition. I don't hear that word a lot. So that's very helpful. Joan. Hey, Catherine, um, thank you for all the various ideas that you uh, brought to us this morning. It's been wonderful. I think so often people on an individual basis, it's, it's sort of that Mother Teresa syndrome. It's like, I can't possibly do anything that makes a difference. I'm one little drop in an ocean of water. So, you know, what I, if, if I leave the tap water running a shorter period of time, what difference is that really going to make? So I guess that's the, part of the question is what maybe should our priorities be in terms of steps that we individually and collectively as a congregation, what can we kind of lobby for in our city? Where are our top priorities and what kinds of things make the most difference right now? I'm so glad you asked that because you're exactly right. We're talking about a huge global problem that the planet will survive. The question is, will our civilization survive? Right. And that question is still open. We don't know the answer to that because the answer is up to us and our choices. So we have this huge global problem and then we say, what should we do about it? And somebody says, oh, take shorter showers and change your light bulbs. <laughs> and we're like, oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that's gonna fix a global problem, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. We know from an instinctive level that the solutions we're being presented with are completely out of sync with the magnitude of the problem. and. Our gut instinct is correct. Changing one light bulb, recycling a pla one plastic bottle, or turning that tab off a little sooner is not going to even be a drop in the bucket. So I've done a deep dive into how we as individuals can make a difference because um, motivated in part by my faith, I believe that each of us is part of the body and we have a function. Even if we might just be one single cell <laughs> in that huge body, we have a function in that body. So I asked myself, what could our true function be if it isn't just changing a light bulb? And let me be clear, I have changed my light bulbs. So I've written an entire book about this, which I was talking earlier with Chip about this. I might come back and have a chat with you about this book once it's out in September. Mm -hmm. But here's the bottom line. It turns out that our number one way to make a difference is through our influence on others because we are all connected to each other. Now, social scientists use the word network, but I like to use the word body because a body is all connected to each other. And so by connecting with each other, we can change what social scientists call social norms, which is just our perspective on the way the world is and the way the world should be. So for example, when, um, when I uh, decided every year, I decided to do two new habits two new um, environmentally friendly habits to cut my carbon footprint and decrease my impact on the planet. So uh, this year I decided to um, switch to uh, bars in the bathroom. So I didn't use plastic anymore, you know, in shampoo bottles and things like that. So not only did I do that, but I made sure to post it on social media. Mm. I said, actually I think it's a box here. I said, I'm going with shampoo bars now. I'll let you know how it goes. And all of a sudden everybody was like, oh, shampoo bars, where did you get those? How are they? Maybe I should use them too. So it's contagious. Mm -hmm. They've actually showed, they were wondering, two, two researchers in Connecticut a number of years ago, they were thinking, 
We've noticed that solar panels have been popping up around Connecticut. I wonder why people get solar panels. So they did a study and they found the number one predictor of whether you have solar panels is if somebody else has them within about a mile of your house. Interesting. Mm. So just seeing them as you walk the dog or you drive to work and knowing that somebody in your neighborhood, you know, with a similar house to yours, similar values to yours had them, it's contagious. That's what makes people change. So now when people say, what's the number one thing I can do? And they expect me to say, you know, get an electric car, stop flying, stop eating meat. The number one thing I say is talk about it. Mm. Use your voice to tell people why it matters to us here and now. It's not a distant issue about the polar bears of the future, it's here. Hurricanes are getting stronger, sea levels rising, heat waves are getting more intense right here where we live. And tell people all the amazing things that people are already doing, that you're doing, that other people you know are doing, that corporations are doing, Microsoft, Apple, even Walmart. Talk about what the city's doing, talk about what the state's doing, talk about new technology, talk about what's happening in poor countries. Talk about how during the pandemic, 90% of new electricity installed around the world during the pandemic was clean energy. Much of it in places where they don't have coal or gas or oil, but they've got sun, they've got wind. So it's revolutionizing the lives of poor people around the world. So talking about it is the number one most important thing we can do because that sets off the right type of contagion. We know all about the wrong type of contagion and that's why we're all wearing masks. But with this, we want the right kind of contagion. And that contagion begins by something very simple, which is just talking about it. I love that idea. And I love that you take on two new habits each year to help change. And I'm wondering, we begin Lent in about a week and a half. And I'm wondering if that might be something that a number of people here at Christchurch could do is to uh, make a change in whatever they do and then to talk about it on their social media accounts all during Lent. Uh, maybe not every day for the same thing, but you know, I just, I love that idea of the um, being a social influencer um, in an environmental creation care kind of way. That's, that's just lovely, it is. I think that's a great idea. Uh, let me just give people a couple of quick ideas if they're looking for ideas. Please, please. Um, so, so one thing that I've done is reducing my food waste mm -hmm. because as we talked about food waste, we throw out about 40% of the food we produce. So just being more careful with the leftovers and the groceries. And what I did was I used to grocery shop once every two weeks and then pile everything up. Half the veggies would go bad and I'd end up throwing them out. So now I go grocery shopping, I go pick it up um, uh, about twice a week. Uh -huh. And I just get much smaller amounts with lots of fresh veggies, which actually helps us reduce our meat too. I switched our meat to a local provider. So um, it's sustainably and locally grown since industrial meat production is a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions. And I also make sure we take our little bags to the grocery store too. Um, switched out our light bulbs, got programmable thermostats, um, got rid of our freezer and put in drying racks. So I just hang up the clothes to dry. We did, um, like I mentioned, we have those solar panels. And let me add a couple of things you might not think about. What about following a Christian organization like um, the Evangelical Environmental Network or Tear Fund or Arasha, A-R-O-C-H-A, Arasha USA, or Climate Caretakers uh -huh. that you sign up for their newsletter at Climate Caretakers and they send you a th something every month telling you three things you can do that month. Oh, nice. Um, so, or Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. There's also Catholic Climate Covenant. Um, follow them on social media and share their posts. That's something you can do that's actually very tangible. I have worked with Interfaith Power and Light. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned them. Yes, I work with them too. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. That is fabulous. Apparently, I'm so moved that I'm frozen in the video. <laughs> <laughs> you are. We can hear you. We just, you know, you're, you're very solemn sitting there. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, those are such wonderful ideas. And I think that we are fortunate to live in a city of Charlotte who they are, I shouldn't say who I guess, but the city itself um, and the planners for it are, they have, there's a Charlotte 2040 plan to um, build substantially upon the mass transit possibilities and not just mass transit via light rail and 
um, and the buses and stuff, but also the um, bicycle paths and things like that, and to put in much more green space that is sustainable, especially in neighborhoods that don't have much green space. Uh, so, um, and I also love one more thing to go back to what she said a little bit ago is, is the direct relationship between caring for our creation and standing for environmental justice so that we can all have clean water. We can all have a park we can walk in near our house or, you know, something like that. Um, that is so important. Do you think that the um, spotlight that the pandemic has shown on the disparity, how, how this pandemic has affected um, people very differently depending upon where they are socioeconomically or, or racially or whatever, do you think that that same spotlight for showing up disparities will help um, the same thing with creation care and, and about the environment? Um, I certainly hope it will because COVID has highlighted the very same fault lines that run through our society that climate change has been highlighting for years. Right. And let me give you a very direct connection. So burning fossil fuels is responsible for nearly all of our air pollution here in the U.S. And it's responsible for most of our carbon emissions, which are causing climate change too. So when you burn this stuff, it produces air pollution and carbon dioxide, which is wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. Now, in the United States, every year, an average of 200,000 people, 200,000 people die from air pollution every year. Wow. Every year. Now, what are our COVID deaths at so far in the United States? I'm not sure of the latest number, but I, I'm pretty sure we're over half a million. Um, so. Yes, which is, which is a, I mean, absolutely heartbreaking number. Um, and we, we know that people are dying from COVID. In fact, many of us know people who have died from COVID. Uh, but when we think about air pollution, can you think of somebody you know who has died from the respiratory diseases that are exacerbated from air pollution? You might or you might not. We don't talk about it because the people who are most affected by that are people in lower income brackets, people who live in poor neighborhoods, who can't afford to live in better neighborhoods, people who live in poor neighborhoods who not only have bad air pollution, they have limited access to affordable health care. So they might not go to the doctor or be able to go to the doctor. They're also usually um, more susceptible to things like flooding when we get storms and hurricanes. And we see this playing out with COVID because it turns out that when your lungs have been exposed to air pollution for years and even decades, you're more vulnerable to coronavirus. Right. You're, you're more likely if, if you're exposed to get it, if you get it to get really sick or even die. So for example, in the city of Chicago, I don't know the stats for Charlotte, but in Chicago, a third of the population in Chicago is black, but 70% of the COVID deaths are among the black community and they think that air pollution is the reason why. Right. Poor neighborhoods are so often located next to industrial areas and, and they're pumping out all of that stuff as well. So yeah, wow. Hmm. Well, well, Catherine, uh, say something to us about um, about this book that you've written because I, I am, I'm excited to think with you about maybe some of the work that we can do full going forward and how you can be a resource to us. Talk, tell us about this book. And I would I think, love to. Yeah. So, so as I talk to people um, around the US and really around the world, I often let people ask me questions. I use something called Poll Everywhere where people can type their questions in and then other people can upvote the questions they most want answered. Hmm. And as I spoke to people around, you know, church groups, schools, universities, older people, younger people, people in the US, people outside the US, I started to see over the last two or three years that the same questions were being asked again and again, and they were being upvoted to the top again and again. Everybody wanted to know two things. And these two things were, how do I talk to and then insert my family, my coworkers, my friends, um, my elected official. How do I talk to them about climate change? 
I don't know what to say, or I tried and it didn't go well. And so we feel like we want to talk about it because if we're concerned about something, we want to talk about it, but we don't know how to make that happen. And then the second question I was getting was, what gives you hope? Mm. So I decided to write a book that answers those two questions. And I'm very excited about it. It's going to be coming out in September. It is called Saving Us. And the subtitle is A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. Mm. And the way I look at it is this. Climate change is the most politically polarized issue that we have today. It is also long term the greatest threat that confronts human civilization. If we can manage to get together on this, what else could we fix? Yeah. Well, I, and I guess that that's what gives you hope. You know, I'm struck, uh, but, but do speak into that a little bit more in, in light of, you know, a lot of what, what we're seeing in the political discourse and, and the like. What, what gives you hope? I, I imagine faith is a piece of that, but say it, something It's a big more. piece of it. Yeah. Um, often we feel like hope should come from positive circumstances, mm. but we know both from history and from our faith that hope is actually the idea that there could be something better in very dark circumstances. Mm. So the early church was not living in comfortable circumstances. Many of them were facing persecution and hardships. And when the apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, he talked very specifically about hope. And here's where he started. He started with suffering. And he said that suffering leads to perseverance and perseverance leads to character and character leads to hope. Mm. And that hope will not disappoint because ultimately our hope is placed in God. And so often I feel like we, and again, this relates back to us as Christians here in the United States, we place our hope in people, especially in political leaders. Mm. We think if only the right person could get to Washington, that person could fix everything. And of course, humans are fallible. So whoever they are and whatever we believe, they never quite live up to expectations. And then somebody else gets in and turns everything around. So rather than placing our hope in people to fix this for us, our hope ultimately is based in God. The idea that he has given each of us the ability, the power to act, the ability to love others and a sound mind to make those decisions. He's prepared those good works for us in advance. And what also encourages me, and I think encourages all of us, people of faith or not, is looking around and seeing who's with us. Mm. So often we feel like we're the only person and we're running and we're running. We have our eyes fixed on that hope that we're trying to get towards. And we just feel so lonely and discouraged. But if we just look to our left and our right, we realize, oh, there's a lot of other people who are doing this too. Mm -hmm. There's people could be right here in my church. They could be right here in my city. They could be at my school or place of work. They could be on the other side of the world, but they're moving in the same direction too. Mm -hmm. So a big part of what gives all of us hope, whoever we are, I've found is sharing stories, which gets back again to talking, right? Talking mm -hmm. about what we're doing, what other people are doing, what we've read about that's happening. That hopeful, those hopeful stories show us that we're not alone, that there are changes that are happening, that a better world really is possible. And we need that hope because without hope, we're going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy of despair. Hmm. Well, this has been a very hopeful conversation. And I feel like we've only uh, scratched the surface of it. But uh, normally, I, I like to ask our Faith Forum guests to give us a challenge, but I think you've already given us one. And I think, Joan, you know, you really spoke into it, that perhaps uh, we can look at a number of things that you recommended and come up with a list of ideas for thinking about changes we can make in our own lives. And maybe this is precisely something we can do this Lent uh, and, to, and to commit to having a, an ongoing conversation uh, about our own stewardship and the, and the change that we can make in this world. Uh, Catherine, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us today. And I'm excited about your new book. And uh, we're, we're thinking a lot about what it means for us to heal and grow and in, this, in these challenging times. And it'll be wonderful to have you back uh, when we can really dig into that book. And I wish you all of God's blessings as you uh, are both a pastor and a prophet uh, in, in your work. Uh, this has been an incredible conversation today. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been great.
It was such a pleasure. God bless. Thank you everybody for joining us.